Well, I'll tell you, I'm freaking out because I, I hate doing live shows. Yeah. I, I loathe it. It's, uh, it's, uh, <laughs> I would rather get frostbite again. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Welcome to Hamdom Thoughts, a podcast about ham radio, electronics, software, and, and tinkering. I'm your host, Dennis, FCC licensed amateur extra radio operator, call sign 86DM. I'm honored to have Julian OH8STN on the show today. Julian is an expat who is very familiar with outdoor operation and is well known for his deeply researched and well-documented off-grid battery and solar builds with an emphasis on emergency communications. Julian's YouTube videos were some of the early ones I discovered that helped me on a journey toward building my own ham radio power solutions. Thank you for joining us on episode 18 today. Stay tuned. Got Julian here. Hey, Julian. It's great to have you on Hello. the podcast today. My Hello, morning. Dennis. Great to be here. How are you? I'm doing great. It's my morning, your evening. You're out in Finland. I'm here in the northern part of central California. How is it over there? It's uh, cold. It's getting colder <laughs> here. And uh, in, my lo- in my previous episode, talked about the cold in Colorado, but I imagine you've taken that up a few levels. <laughs> <laughs> with uh, the cold of Northern <laughs> Europe. Tell me about that. How, how is it out there? Like you're in Celsius. So that's going to yeah, be like, we're in Celsius, but uh, it's going to be like I mean, zero yeah. Celsius. Yeah. Well, or, at the moment, I mean, literally today it's uh, it's about plus four Celsius or what's that about 30, 38, 39 yeah. degrees, 30-ish. something like that. And uh, yeah, it's, um, it can be pretty challenging, but you know you have to prepare for it. You actually go out and camp in that environment, so yeah, yeah, I do. <laughs> and you know, that's it, something we wouldn't I, consider over here. Or I don't know, some soda hams I know would actually do that, but <laughs> well, it, it's it's like I said, it's a matter of preparation. You know, um, you, you know, you start by doing like a short little trips. For example, I, I started this while walking the dog, you know, um, we would stop during the winter, make a little fire. And, uh, just in those days operate six meters with an eight one seven or something like that. And, mm-hmm. you know, as the years went on, you, uh, you learn how to deal with the weather. You, you build up your, your equipment and, uh, you're able to uh, to stay out longer and do more, and eventually that turns into something you you know might enjoy or might regret, depending on how you uh, <laughs> you know how it turns out. But uh, yeah, I wanted yeah. to touch on your your TP setup. It's it's really cool. Uh, you even have a little wood burning stove inside there. But uh, that's right. Let's get yeah. to that in a little bit. Uh, okay. Let me start off with. Uh, again, welcoming you. And and I want you to tell us a bit about yourself, you know, your background and how you got started in all of this. Uh, wow. (laughs) That's a, that's a huge abstract question. Um, well, if we start with the childhood, uh, I come from a shortwave listening, uh, electronics building, you know, a background also, you know, a bit of chemistry. I mean, I was kind of a nerd uh, as a kid but i was a football playing nerd so you know yeah, good mix. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah not your traditional uh getting beat up after lunch type uh, type nerd but uh yeah electronics shortwave radio cb radio those are things i all got into as a kid and actually the uh, the radio aspect of it uh launched 
because my dad was a truck driver. And uh, at the time we lived in, in Southern California and uh, you know, whenever he came over the grapevine with the truck, it was kind of like line of sight, you know, to our house. And I would talk to him on the CB radio uh, all the way, you know, from the grapevine back down into Southern California. And uh, we set up a, a CB radio at home and, there, you know, there were no cell phones or, or things like that in those yeah. days. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, it, it started with the, the CB radio and, and from there, uh, you know, electronic kit building. Um, I'll tell you a quick story. My neighbor down the street was a ham radio operator, Tom. I don't remember his call sign. Um, I mean, that was... Uh, you know, 40 something years ago, yeah. but uh, he noticed that I had uh, put up this ground plane antenna on top of my roof. And as I was walking home from school one day, he said, Hey, you know, I noticed you have that antenna on your roof. Well, what is it for? And, you know, I explained that, Oh yeah, I'm talking to my dad and talking to my uncle, uh, you know, uh, in their trucks uh, with my CB radio. And he says, ah, he says, well, you know, when you have some time, stop by and I'll show you my ham shack. And I thought, you know, okay, this weird old man, <laughs> why does he want me to, you know, <laughs> stop in his place? But I, you know, I, I knew the guy since I was, uh, you know, just barely able to walk. So why not? And I stopped, actually, it was the next day. I stopped over and uh, he said, here are three general electric tube type. Uh, mobile sets i mean mobile they were probably about 20 30 pounds each and uh, he says uh, none of them work but they all have parts to that you can build one which works you know wow. so he, he he made a challenge for me nice. and uh i got all those radios home and uh, set up a little place uh, behind the garage and you know it was uh where we kept the lawnmower and things like that and <laughs> You know, I, I, I put put everything on the table and I started playing around with these tubes and uh, trying to understand. Actually, the only thing that was wrong was, you know, he mixed up the tubes and I had to figure out which ones were working, which ones weren't. And eventually I came up with a, a you know, a receiver and uh, I took it back to him and I said, OK, this one works. And he says, well, it's yours. Oh, you nice. Know? Yeah. So I gave you a uh, nice challenge. You yeah. puzzled through it with the parts of three different radios and yeah. And he let it, you have it, it. Yeah, that's right. And I was hooked. And uh, with that radio, I was, you know, listening to BBC World Service and uh, Deutsche Bella and, uh, you know, all kind of broadcasters from all over the world. I even discovered a mystery theater that was my favorite shortwave program. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it was like a, uh, what do you call it? It was like a, you have to forgive me, Dennis, because, you know, I don't get to speak English every day. <laughs> so <laughs> I forget these, you know, I'm an American, but I've been here a long time and I forget these words. Mm -hmm. But anyway, it was like a, a, a radio show. I don't know how old you are, but it was a, a radio show. And, uh, you know, there were actors and things like that. But instead of watching them on TV, they played it out over the radio. Oh, cool. So. Yeah, I don't yeah, think I've ever listened to any radio shows when I was a kid. I was a, a child of the 70s and 80s. So, um, yeah. I mean, there perhaps there were shows on there, but I, I was just kind of tuning the dial all over the place <laughs> and trying to find the weird sounds, not really the the voice uh, shortwave. So if I'd hear yeah. like, like little chirps of some kind of beacon or something like that, that's what would fascinate me about, oh. Oh, about shortwave if I just heard voices, I was like, ah, that's just another talk show. I don't want to listen to that. <laughs> yeah. Well, there was another aspect of, of music, uh, of radio that got me involved or, you know, deeper, let's say. And that was, um, there was a, there was a, a radio station. I don't know if it still exists or not. Um, it was in San Diego. And at the time I was, uh, up north uh, near LA County. Actually, I don't know if you know Knott's Berry Farm, but I grew uh, yes. up very close I to there. I remember that, yeah. yes. Yeah. Um, but there was a station in San Diego called 91X, and I happened to hear it uh, when we were down there going to uh, Tijuana, you know? 
anyway, uh, I couldn't hear it from my home. So I, I actually built an antenna so that I can get better reception with our FM radio so that I could listen oh, wow. to this cool music. How old were you? From, uh, at that time, maybe 12 or 13. Wow, 12 years old already building your first antenna. <laughs> yeah, well, that's, that's actually great. it was logical. And, you know, I learned about building the antennas when I, I built, I had to build a, a wire antenna uh, for the shortwave radio. Um, the CB antenna, the first one I had, the ground oh, plane, yes. that came from Radio Shack. So I really that's didn't right. learn from that. But, you know, it, it's all... Uh, it all goes into the basket, you know, and you 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 learn uh, bits and pieces from everything. Am I rambling? <laughs> no, this is great. <laughs> yeah. So you have really focused on battery building in in the early part of your videos, and yes, as well uh, emergency communications or MCOM preparation, yep. and you actually make. Uh, a few videos where you distinguish between preparedness and emergency communications yes, and various other levels of just actual practice and preparation. Can you tell us about how you got started in, in the battery building and, and MCOM? Well, um, okay. This gets a bit personal, but I don't mind. Um, most of you probably don't know it, but I'm, quite blind, <laughs> you know. Um, so I don't, you know, I, you've probably seen my motorcycle on, on the channel. I don't know if actually if I've, if I've shown it, but I have a Honda Varadero and I've, I've done iron butt rallies and things like that. But some years ago, I had a misdiagnosis uh, with a problem I was having with my eyes. And um, of course, that led to some, you know, eyesight deterioration. Mm. And uh no need to be like weird about it or anything. That's just life. You know, you suck it up and you move on. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, but anyway, the point is that uh, I don't drive anymore. So, mm -hmm. or, or, I mean, I can, but uh, not very fast and I'd probably get in an accident if I could. So I focused on, uh, well, you know, the bicycle because it's slow enough that, uh, that I can see, you know, mm -hmm. or uh, hiking or skiing, but this is where the man portable aspect of, uh, of my, my hobbies came from. I wanted to do the same things I was doing, you know, on the motorcycle and the motorcycle touring, but I had to switch it over to skiing or hiking or biking, things like that. Things I could do with my sight limitations. And that was one of the triggers for building batteries. Because at the time, uh, I was thinking about, for example, I had the 818, but I was thinking about a KX2. And I thought to myself, there's no way the battery for a QRP radio is going to or should be bigger than or heavier than the radio you're actually <laughs> trying to power. It's just yeah. ridiculous. Um and, you know, there was no one was was talking about this. No one was doing anything with uh, uh, with lithium batteries or they were doing them with lithium ion batteries, but they were taking them out of laptops and things like that, which from my perspective, isn't uh, sustainable from a preparedness point of view. You know, it may be cheaper, but uh, anyway, that that's how it, it got. It, it was born out of necessity. I was trying to actually reduce the weight of my systems, you know, the power supply was a was a, a a restrictive element of the entire station. You know, you can't put. Uh, I tried it. I didn't show it on the channel, but I I tried it and I failed miserably. I had a uh, what was it? A twelve uh, amp hour AGM battery in my backpack. And oh boy! Yeah, Happy it was stuff. ridiculous. <laughs> yeah. So from there we. Uh, from there, I said that I need to design a, a better battery pack, something that's lighter, as easy to charge as a lead acid battery, and uh, it, it shouldn't cost very much. And I didn't care if the cost savings came uh, from the front end when you buy it or uh, over the long term in terms of you know cycle life and, and the investment over time. I didn't care which one it was as long as it was uh, lightweight and you know what I mean. I um, 
I noticed that you spend quite a bit of time researching and you often <laughs> beat yourself up on like I'm a, I'm a member of your Patreon and yeah. you beat yourself up on those those uh, member only posts and say you know I apologize for taking so long but I really want to research this in full and I've noticed that about you're very methodical very detailed you do test things in various scenarios and I'm just curious how long it took you to even get to the point where you were sharing about your first lithium iron phosphate battery because I could imagine that's a deep dive in itself <laughs> just yeah. looking at different chemistries looking at different ways of putting things together tell us about your process there yeah well short answer is it took about a year before any of you ever saw it I started off with the lithium ion sorry that's not actually true I started off with a double a battery pack mm-hmm you know, so I, I actually, I used double A batteries. It was the, uh, hold on a minute here. I don't remember the name of them, but I have one here. It was the uh, Sanyo. Um, they're not Sanyo anymore. Their name has changed. Anyway, it, it was a nickel metal hydride battery, uh, like a 2700 milliamp uh, Yeah. Yeah. Uh, nickel metal hydride battery. And I put a few of those in parallel, soldered them up and uh, made a battery pack, but they were the same problems I had, you know, you, you still don't get, you know, the total capacity out of them without ruining them. And uh, the weight was still ridiculously too much. So the process was uh, trying to find a balance, you know, between something that would not explode if you did something stupid with it. <laughs> um, no, seriously. Yeah, uh, like because, the uh, RC batteries that have no, yeah, no that's protection. Right. Yeah. So oh, don't even get me started on the Hobby King. Uh, <laughs> 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 but uh, okay, but finding something which wouldn't blow up if you did something stupid, because I needed to share this on the channel. And uh, certainly someone would do something stupid. So I needed to avoid that. And that ruled out the lithium ion battery packs or, you know, harvesting them from the, uh, not that it's a good idea if you have the skills to do it, but I didn't want to promote something which was dangerous on the channel. Yeah. So we started with the, the AA batteries, too heavy, too little uh, uh, capacity, moved over to lithium ion batteries. Excellent. Uh, but volatile if you do something wrong and the output voltage was too high if you used 4s if you use 3s you lose the benefit uh, with the you lose the benefit with the uh, the capacity yeah you know yeah so there are some radios like a kx2 or the the 818 or some of the zygu radios as well which will run down to like eight volts nine volts um but still it, you know, when you're trying to push out, uh, you know, maximum power from your radio when you're operating QRP. So even a 3S uh, lithium ion battery is going to, to fail pretty quickly. And that brought me to the lithium iron phosphate batteries, which had the, well, basically, you know, they had the same output uh, uh, voltage as a, a fully charged lead acid battery or, uh, you know, uh, a lead acid battery that was uh, being charged by the alternator in your car. Mm -hmm. So around 14.2 to 14.4 volts, in some cases for 14.6, but you know, it wouldn't last very long uh, if we ran it that, at that voltage. So the goal was to find something which would run all of our radios, you know, Yezu, Icom, Kenwood, whatever radio, because the standard was 13.8 volts. And then uh, find something which wouldn't blow up if you tr uh, treat it poorly. Uh, find something which was relatively easy to get. And find something which would run a 100-watt radio without this Pukert's effect uh, that we get with the lead-acid battery. That Pukert's effect, you know, when you keep uh, contesting or, or, or putting a load constantly, on-off, on-off uh, load on the battery... So the capacity is, is reduced uh, faster and faster and faster. And the lithium iron phosphate was right there. It was perfect for our needs. And 
it was all trial and error. So the answer to your question is there was no process. <laughs> it was all research and I didn't know where it would lead me. I started in one place and I, I you know, I read and I tested and I waited for YouTube uh, money to, <laughs> to come in so I could mm -hmm. order more batteries and buy more. Uh, you know what I mean? And uh, yeah, eventually we arrived here. Yes, and definitely an inspiration to many to build their own systems, including myself. So yeah, I'm, nice I'm glad you put in the, the effort and just thinking. Uh, if I were to trial and error my way through, I probably would have gave up <laughs> after yeah. a few months. You know, it's like it, it, that's, that's something to be admired. Yeah. Well, that's one of the reasons it takes so long. Uh, sometimes between my videos because uh, I'm either waiting for funding or I'm waiting for parts or uh, I'm just, you know, in the process of learning. It's, uh, it's, <laughs> it's a mo monotonous. Is that the right word? Is, yeah. It's a monotonous. monotonous yeah. Process. And, uh, but I actually enjoy doing it because my, my fetish or what I really get off on is sharing the results, you know, and knowing that at the end of that, you know, I can show you, you know, how how we got started and uh, where we ended up, how we arrived. You know what I mean? Yes, and, uh, yes. Yeah, that's what I get off on. And, you know, when people ask me a question, I can answer it, you know, with full confidence. Yes. Because, you know. I've already done all the fails that everyone's uh, asking yeah, me Yeah, that's about. another thing I wanted to comment on is on your yeah. Patreon. You are very responsive, and I'm surprised considering, you know, the number of subscribers you have and the, the number of Patreon supporters you have. It's uh, any question I've noticed on your posts, um, you're, you're definitely there. Like within a day, you're, you're, yeah. you're answering them. Uh, addressing their questions, their concerns, or if it's like a rig review, you will add insight to something that you didn't mention in your videos. It's, it seems to me like a full-time job almost. Well, it almost is, you know, although the pay with my last job was better. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, honestly, you know, it almost is. And uh uh, to be completely honest, I mean, you all know that I'm retired and I'm okay. Here's connecting the dots again. I'm retired because of my eyes. That's why I, I retired from broadcasting. Uh, it was because of this problem with my eyes, but I thought then, well, first I, I, I had a, I, I've, I founded a youth club here in Olu uh, f uh, teaching kids about uh, leadership and uh, airsoft or the leadership and responsibility through Airsoft, um, you know, but uh, that club, it grew, it, it got a little bit too big for me, let's say it that way. So I wanted to, uh, to come up with something, some other way to give back to the community since I, I you know, I'm retired. And I thought, well, you know, there's uh, uh, communications, you know, amateur radio communications. So, that's uh, that's the full time job aspect of it. I mean, of course, I do other things, you know, but um, that's why I can do so much because I I'm just giving back. It is kind of my job, kind of. Yeah, hmm. cool. I don't know if we touched on it, but when did you become a ham? Oh, well, there's a funny story behind that, but <laughs> let's see if we go into it or not. Um, 1999. I, I got licensed. Okay. That we were, we was, were licensed uh, the same year then. Oh, outstanding. I, uh, I picked up a Radio Shack two meter handheld. And before I, I was fascinated that it wasn't a CB radio. It was, you know, yeah. this handheld that could really go far, but I was like, I wish I could transmit on this thing. So I was motivated to study. <laughs> yeah. And that's how I became a ham. Actually, I, I would have become a ham in the 80s, but uh, I got turned off by one of the large monolithic amateur radio societies in the United States at the time. <laughs> oh, okay. I wonder yeah. which one that is. <laughs> oh, no, I don't I'm know. Not... <laughs> Let's not go there. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, no. It 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 was 
actually it was a good thing. You know, it was a good thing uh, because I probably wasn't mature enough for it at the time. And, uh, you know, when I came into it later on, I knew exactly, you know, within reason what I, what I wanted to do. So it, mm -hmm. it was kind of a, a blessing. So 1999. Mm -hmm. So that makes yeah. it, uh, what, uh, 20, 21, 21, 22 21 years. years now. Yeah. Excellent. Pretty soon I'm going to be one of those guys saying that uh, back in the good old days. He, <laughs> <laughs> well, I do find myself saying that now. Yeah. So I think we're there. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Although if you ask other hams, we're, we haven't, re we're still young and we haven't really been hams that long. You know? No. A lot of my mentors, they, they got licensed in the fifties. You know, that's right. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. My, uh, I, I suppose my primary mentor was licensed in the in the '60s, and she's just amazing. the The amount of knowledge, you know, it's just. Uh, I hope that I can, at least, you know, be a shadow of what uh, what she's, you know, shared and brought to the community. It's crazy. Yeah. Hmm. Cool. Well, I wanted to play one of your videos it's actually one of my favorite ones is where you build your solar generator i'll just play the, yeah. the first part of it so that people can actually hear you know the format of your videos and and how you introduce the topics here please let's, let's yeah. have a listen one of the pillars of this channel is portable battery and solar power for field communication self-reliance and preparedness so the amount of effort, the amount of time we spend on DIY builds and engineering new solutions is something viewers of this channel have come to expect. But since there's no one-size-fits-all solution for every scenario, we need to keep stepping up the game. So today we're building the most advanced DIY portable solar generator you've seen on YouTube to date. Today's build is a 12 volt, 576 watt hour lithium iron phosphate solar generator. All right, guys, let's get started. You are listening to the emergency broadcast systems. This station broadcasts emergency news and official information on the air for a sign area. There's lots of information to cover in this video, so we're going to go through this. Your and video or your build. YouTube channel is entitled Survival Tech Nord or OH8STN yes. Survival Tech Nord. And... I have alerts set up for it so every time I see a new video. Well, of course, I'm on your Patreon, so I've, I've seen a lot of the videos before they, <laughs> they come out. But um, I, I get really excited when they when there's a new one there. It, it, you have quite a few off-grid YouTube videos, but more recently have been very active in practicing field radio operations. Yep. And more recently have had some very scenic long-haul campouts out there. Why don't you tell us more about your YouTube channel and how it came to be and, and really w where it's headed? Well, when I started the channel, I thought that there was a lot of, um, well, there was a gap, let's say, uh, in what people were talking about. P uh, people in, in the amateur radio community were sharing, you know, exactly the, the same things. There were lots of videos about contesting or learning CW or... Uh, you know what I mean? Just uh, the the normal things people outside of the ham radio community uh, think ham radio operators do, mm -hmm. and there was very little emphasis on uh, the practical applications or the practical side of amateur radio, especially for preparedness and emergency communications. I mean, there was a uh, guerrilla com and uh, a comms prepper doing some things. Uh, but for the most part, most of the channels were just doing, let's say, normal, in quotes, uh, ham radio stuff, which wasn't terribly interesting. I mean, it was, but when you want to do something off-grid or portable or without a car or, uh, mm -hmm. you know, sustainably, um, you know, someone needed to step up and and trigger some thinking some reactions you know to get people saying hey that's a that's a good idea mm -hmm. you know um so it, it really came because i wasn't finding 
you know, a lot of the the content that uh, I was looking for <laughs> on YouTube from the ham radio community. So, yeah, you know that that's where it started from. And of course, there were some other triggers that, uh, you know, from this preparedness perspective, and uh, that that's actually a sad story. So I don't want to get into that, but uh, you know. Needless to say, off-grid communications or communications for preparedness, income, it, it's um, it's dear to my heart, let's say it that way. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, that's one of the driving aspects. Even if I don't say preparedness or, you know, prepper in my, my videos, each and every one of them has its aspects, you know, from there, as well as uh, income and emergency communications. Where's the channel going? Wow. Well, actually, I, I've let's say um, these days I'm doing a lot more with uh, talking about radios and uh, reviewing radios and equipment. And one of the things I, I, you know, brought to the community is this honest review. You know, if something, well, I never tried to badmouth anything. There was one product. Uh, which was being blatantly lied about. And I brought that to the surface. But for the most part, even if it's a bad product, I try to focus on how we can use this product. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And um, But if something is simply bad, I'm going to call it out. I'm going to say it's bad. I'm going to tell why it's bad. And I'm going to show it failing uh, in my videos. On the flip side, um, if something is a great product, but it's not getting much attention, I'm going to say why it's great, you know, both the good sides and the bad sides, the ups and downs with it yeah. and how we can use it in practice in the field. And it doesn't matter if it's an antenna or a radio or building a battery pack or uh, a new laptop. It, 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 it doesn't matter. What matters is how we can make use of these things in the field. And that's why I'm trying to show these things on the channel. Operating from home is pretty easy. So I, you know, I really don't show that many videos from operating from home, you know, from home, I can talk around the world, uh, mm -hmm. but try to do that in, in the field. And, and that's what the channel is about. Like when the lights are out, you know, when you're not yeah. at home, when you're, you know, when you're stuck in the mud. So, uh, yeah, that's, yeah. I, and, I, uh, I actually do like your home setup. I've seen a little bit here and there of it. Yep. You have a nice tower, solar panel on that tower. Uh, and, uh, yeah. you know, it's, it's pretty high up. And you also have, uh, I, I also copied you in a sense. I, I like that you built your solar generator, your, your giant one, and that powers <laughs> your whole station. You don't use any grid power even no. at home. And that's what I do as well now. I don't rely on the grid at all for my home operation. So it's yeah. always some form of, of battery power if I'm in the field or at home. I'm just used to going that route. Well, do you know why this is a good idea, Dennis? Because when, you, when, when the gun's to our head and we have to do it, uh, you know, we will have had months or weeks or months or years of practice. Uh, you know, whether the, the power is on or off in my home coming from the grid, it could actually make no difference to me. The, the grid could go down in the whole community right now, and you and I wouldn't notice any difference uh, yep. because, you know, <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know what I mean. Yeah. Um, and uh, this is how we train, you know, not like just a, a field day once in a year, but doing it daily and living it. Yeah. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, I, that's, that's exactly what I'm saying is that there is a, is, is kind of a, I don't know, I find comfort in knowing that I am using this thing that's supposed to be for emergencies and, you know, I'm, it, it's just second nature that yeah. it's just part of my station. And I wish I could do that. I wish I could just completely be off grid and, and be able to do all aspects of, of living yeah. on, on the backups. That way I know that, okay, I have this uh, benefit of internet connection, but should that go or, you know, other things yeah. like even my refrigeration, I have a freezer right now that is 
uh, 12 volt DC power. Now that's not such a big deal in, in Finland. I imagine it's cold enough that, you know, most of the yeah, time, just dig a hole in the ground. <laughs> <laughs> but in here in California, we have fires now every year. And yeah. I've, I've just said to myself, this is not unusual anymore. This is what we should expect every summer is we're going to have darkened yeah. skies. We're going to have power outages. And so plan accordingly. And so now I have this freezer set up that is powered by uh, solar panels and to a nice battery bank. And it congratulations, you brother. know, if, if ever we lose our power, then we're transferring things over to the, the backup freezer. And that's where I keep a lot of stuff right now. So it, it's, um, it's just something that I don't know. I'm rambling now, but it's something that no, nah, no, this is <laughs> I this feel is, is actually is pretty important. absolutely magnificent. So, can yeah. you tell us a little bit more about your off grid? Your when you take those trips out into the wilderness, uh, yep. Tell us about your setup. I mean, uh, we we talked about this briefly <laughs> in the beginning. You have a yeah. TP. You have various stoves, uh, various TPs that you've used. Um, I'm curious because, you know, when I think of camping, I think of the California style of camping, which is these dome tents that you get at REI or, you know, these, these different, um, you know, setups that are, that people will, will camp in for quite a while, but, uh, you've settled upon the TP style and having an inside, uh, heating method yep. and, no, what do you, what do you call those things? The the footprint that people put on the ground. You don't even do that. You just on the ground. No, directly. Actually, or, I don't know why people think that. Uh, uh, okay. <laughs> let well, why me, don't you clarify? <laughs> I, yeah, I'll address that one first because uh, I, I a couple of times a week I get messages like Julian, you know, uh, that tent or that TV is just re- it's 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 ridiculous. You should get one with a floor. Actually, all of my tents uh, have floors, but usually, and this is probably my fault, so you know you can shoot the cameraman. Um, <laughs> I, <laughs> um, I'm always trying to get a good shot. Yeah. So the TP, talking specifically about the TP, it's modular, and there's uh, three different components to it. So there's the outer shell, and uh, then there's the inner tent which is like three quarters of the the TP floor plus inner walls. And uh, then there's the part you, you, there's the part which doesn't have a floor and that's where the wood stove goes because of course the wood stove would melt the the floor. So that's where we're getting our impression probably is you take the shot of the stove and we think, oh, this guy's just sitting on the cold ground right now. (laughs) Yeah, no chance. (laughs) No chance. And in fact, under the, the, I usually use an inner tent or, okay, I have two options. I can use the inner tent, which has uh, its own floor, um, or I can not use the uh, inner tent and just use the uh, the floor and the floor can be configured for the you know full coverage of the entire tent when I'm not using the stove or uh, as a three quarter floor uh, with the only part uh, exposed you know is in front of the vestibule or actually that's the word in English the vestibule that part you know I can open up and have it as a floor mm-hmm. you know I mean okay. I, I mean I have the ground uh, uh, there if I yeah. want it. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's, um, I need to take shots from different angles <laughs> as I keep getting this question. And it's, uh, as far as the, uh, the, the shelters go or, or the, the station in the field. So, I, you know, this is changing now because we've got some new radios out in the market and uh, I have a couple of them. But primarily, I have uh, uh, three different radios that I've used over the years. And one of them you haven't seen on the channel yet, um, but you've seen the Yezu FT891. And uh, that goes with the, uh, the, the mother of all solar generators, the Monster, the, uh, mm-hmm. the 576 watt hour uh, generator we built on the channel. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's, you know, purely like uh, full on MCOM or preparedness, you know, it's like, um, it's the Puerto Rico disaster uh, style system. Okay. You know, and uh, that's there 
you know, because sometimes you need a QRO system. Uh, on the flip side, uh, I have, uh, this is just the radio side of things. There was the Yezu FT817ND and uh, with a yeah. little 10 watt amplifier. Mm -hmm. And that was my like a high speed, low drag system. But uh, that's, I don't want to say it's phasing out because I have a really special video coming up for that one, but I don't want to give it away just yet. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so I have QRP uh, set up and I have a QRO set up and uh, whether I'm using the TP or not, or if we talk about the TP, for example, uh, for a second, um, the whole idea there with choosing a, a TP is floor space. So uh, I also have one of those, you know, uh, tiny dome tents, although uh, I'm pretty sure I'm going to throw it in the trash <laughs> pretty soon. <laughs> but um, I have one of those dome tents, but the, the TP was uh, chosen because you have a floor space. You have uh, enough room so that you can, you have a, a, a cooking area, for example. Uh, you have a radio operating area, you know, and then you have a sleeping area. And if you have a more than one operator, you know, plus the dog, <laughs> like I often do. Mm -hmm. So having that extra space is, uh, is brilliant. And actually the TP, I would say that it's lighter than most of these uh, dome tents that, uh, you know, that people are using. Really? So, yeah, it's, uh, Interesting. The, the whole thing weighs, if I remember correctly, it's, it's only about three kilos. And that's like all of it. That's the worst case, the, the winter configuration, the mm -hmm. inner tent, the, the, the uh, wood stove, the outer tent, oh, wow. and the uh, center pole. Including yeah. Including the stove. That's, that's fascinating. Yeah. Well, the stove is titanium, you know. Oh, okay. Yeah. So yeah. it's super light. It's, it's super light. Um, and in the summer configuration, if I just take, uh, I don't have to take the floor, but if I just take the, the fly sheet, the outer sheet, and the center pole, it's still pretty lightweight. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, and again, it, it was trying to come up with something which I could carry, man portable or on the bike, mm -hmm. uh, you know, or uh, with skiing with the ski polk like last uh, winter field day. You have to come up with equipment that, uh, that fits the situation, you know, we have. So, you know, I'm not driving a car. You know what I mean? I'm not riding the motorcycle anymore. So I'm either hiking, I'm skiing, or I'm biking, mm -hmm. you know. and um, So how far it, typically do you, do you go? I mean, is this like well, 20 paces into the backyard? Or <laughs> no, no. <laughs> or is this really oh, a distance yeah, that you're biking I, here? I've been pretty tough on some of the other YouTubers for that, uh, getting out of the car, walking 20 paces and setting up and calling it portable. <laughs> but um, no, uh, the furthest I've gone was uh, with all my gear, I guess it was 40 or 50 clicks, 40 or 50 kilometers. Okay. Um, yeah. And of course there are these multi-day trips as well. So, you know, you know, you may move uh, 10 or 15 kilometers per day, uh, set up, stay there a day or two, and then continue the, the trip. But you haven't seen all of those on the channel. Those are the, uh, like, usually when I'm testing something, mm -hmm. you know, uh, but those are the, the trips you don't, you may know that I'm not at home because, you know, you're one of my patrons, but uh, uh, most people don't know what I'm actually doing when I'm, when I'm out and away. So mm -hmm. it, but generally speaking, um, if I'm on the bike, I think the furthest I've gone on the bike was 80 kilometers. I don't wow. know what that is in miles. Yeah. Well, um, times 0.6. So something like almost 50 miles. Yeah. Wow. And, um, and people are, you know, they're, they often ask me, you know, yeah, but your, your bike is electric. But I only use the motor for like going uphill or, you know, <laughs> things like that. Yeah, uh, yeah. The battery never lasts that long, you know, to, uh, to ride, you know, that, that far just on battery power. But um, am I getting off track? No, Dennis? no. I, I, that okay. just popped, a uh, question just popped in my head. Have you ever considered, uh, you know, MacGyvering that e-bike battery to help with your operation? Um, 
yes, but uh, ultimately I, I would never do it. You know, the the e-bike battery is there as a, it's kind of like a helping hand. Let's let's call it like that. Yeah. yeah. So generally, I, I don't use the battery. Um, I don't I don't need to. You know. Um, so generally, I don't use the battery. I just pedal along it because it's nicer than walking. And <laughs> if I have a, a, a an incredible load, like I did when I went, did the island expedition uh, uh, last year. If I have an incredible load, I might, you know, use this pedal assist from the from the bike. So anyway, the point is that I need the battery for the bike to, you know, to be there if I need it. I see. So I don't, yeah, I don't want to waste that power from from the battery mm-hmm. uh, uh, powering my radio equipment, especially because I've got these, you know, battery packs that I've built and solar power, and you know, it's I don't need them. I don't uh, need the bike's battery. Yeah, exactly. For radio. Yeah. Pretty cool. Uh, I wanted to also ask you about um, just the general wildlife and you know situation out there in, in the <laughs> field. I mean, do you have any wildlife dangers out there? Is that why you bring your canine companions with you? Or is no, it more the, of just desolate the, the, <laughs> forest uh, land? The most dangerous uh, predators here are stupid people. But, uh, yeah, I think, I think that's common throughout the world. <laughs> yeah. So, um, of course, we have you know bears and wolves and and things like that. Um, but surprisingly, you know, I mean, being attacked by a bear or or a wolf is is pretty rare. We even have these wolverines, but all of those things generally try to get away from you. And if you happen to happen upon one of them. It was simply by chance and uh, and probably bad luck. So it doesn't mm-hmm. happen very often. Mm-hmm. The two most dangerous predators we have in, in at this latitude, are you ready for it? Go the for it. Uh, the tick is the most dangerous. Ah, yes, and the, yes. Yeah. And, uh, and the, um, I don't know the name of this snake in English. Is it, uh, it might be a, adder black adder can that be that sounds familiar. anyway yeah we have uh we have a snake here that's a horrifically poisonous um and everyone says ah you never see them they try to get away from you but every time i'm out there <laughs> I, you'll you catch know, one I happen, I'll, I'll get one yeah <laughs> Um, you know, and I'm just like, you know, these things, they, I don't know, why don't they like me, (laughs) you know, but uh, Mm -hmm. anyway, yeah, the the ticks are the number one, and those are pretty uh, horrific. Um, It's one of the reasons I like to go up above the Arctic Circle, because they're not, uh, they're not really found there yet, they haven't propagated that far Mm -hmm. north. Um, It's the same with the with the snakes. Yeah. But the other wildlife, I'm not really, uh, I'm not really worried about them. And uh, the only thing I have to worry about is with the snapper, you know, that's, that's the dog you saw in, I guess, my last video, mm-hmm. you know. Um, I mean, I, I, I won't go camping with her when she's in heat, you know, because of the, the wolves. But uh, mm-hmm. for the most part, she will keep almost everything away and she loves to chase reindeer but uh, you know <laughs> i try to discourage that mm-hmm. yeah. are, are re- reindeer dangerous at all like only during that uh, this is a bit funny but during the mating season the, the male reindeer can can be pretty aggressive you know um and and that's not a joke i mean uh, you yeah. really have to yeah. to to really take care about them and stay away from them you yeah. know but no, um, it's it's pretty safe. I mean, generally speaking, there's nothing in the Finnish forest which will uh, which will really kill you unless you're already you know having a foot in the grave anyway. So I'm just thinking. So you're not really packing bear spray. No, nope. uh, perhaps bug spray, but not bear spray, right? Yeah, <laughs> the the mosquitoes are far more uh, intimidating than the the bears 
Mm-hmm. <laughs> that's again, that that's another, uh, with, you know, because the bears, you yell at them and they'll go away. They're not like the brown or black bears back home. You know, these, these uh, bears here, unless, you know, you happen to get between a mom and it's a uh, cub, but uh, for the most part, they, they want nothing to do with you. Yeah. So, yeah, but the mosquitoes and the gnats, they're, they're pretty horrific. It's, yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, I wanted to also talk about your favorite gear. I know that this is the hard question for many, <laughs> but why don't you tell us a bit about things that, and, and coming from you, it's going to be probably something that after hundreds of hours of, of obsessing and, and, you know, just pouring over and, and using, actually practicing and using, your, your well, favorites probably are, are much more informed than most of ours. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'll tell you something. Um, if we can start with my least favorite. Okay. Yeah, but this isn't, uh, I'm not bashing it or anything. I'm just telling the process of how I got where I am, uh, you know, so I can answer your question. So uh, I've owned the Yezu FT817. I've had three of them now since it came out. I, I was working in Switzerland at the time, and I, I guess that was in, in 2000 or 2001. Snatched one up immediately, and I've I've had, well, that original 817, it's gone now. I, I don't have that one anymore. But um, I've carried an 817 with me around the world since, you know, the year it came out. And uh, I always thought, wow, I, I really hate that I have to buy filters for it. And I hate that, you know, I have to change out the, the filters depending on the type of operating that I want to do. If I'm going to do CW or I'm going to do, uh, you know, voice communications or, or something else. And I wasn't clever enough to get one of those while they were available. The, uh, the dual filters from that. I don't remember the name of the company in USA, but mm-hmm. uh, anyway, um, there, and when I got into digital modes and things like that, I thought, oh, wow, I, I really wish the 817 had, an, you know, an audio interface and blah, 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 blah. You know, we, mm-hmm. we've all had the, uh, we, we know the discussion and we know the, the uh, pros and cons. So although I, I've had a blast with the 817 ND and, and 8184, you know, what nearly 20 years it's um it it i started looking for something you know more practical or pragmatic mm-hmm. with a more pragmatic design mm-hmm. and that's how i got to where i am now and that's the the gear choices that i've i've made so uh, if we start with the radios i love the ft891 it's it's my only QRO radio, and the only thing wrong with it is it, unlike the uh, FT991 Alpha, it doesn't have an internal audio interface. I'm looking at it here. I'm mm-hmm. sorry, you can <laughs> you can see from the video. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I I I love that radio, but it doesn't have the internal audio interface. So in that regard, I was kind of wishing uh, I would have bought a 7300. But the FT891 is the only, you know, I mean, it's slightly larger than the FT818, and I'm using an external battery anyway. So as a QRO portable radio, it's magnificent, you know, mm-hmm. and I still recommend people, if you want to operate QRO while portable, go for it. So that's on my portable radio I don't know if I would take it as a mobile radio, mm-hmm. um, but just operating man portable or, or portable, it's a good compromise. The other thing about it was its receive current. So, and that's why I, I, I got the FT891 instead of the 818 and an, and an amplifier, because, you know, there were all these other things with the 818 that I needed to, uh, to add to it, to get it like, you know, to do what I wanted to do. So it wasn't uh, practical, but the 891 is. So you see like uh, where I was I was going, <laughs> the direction I was going. Mm-hmm. And then I thought about, uh, because, you know, in my heart, I'm always going to be a QRP operator. I think many people don't, don't know that about me. 
I, I, I really don't like amplifiers. I have a hostility uh, <laughs> to, <laughs> to amplifiers. But well, uh, I mean, I was introduced to you when, you know, you, you were talking a lot about the 891. So I always assumed that you were a QRO person. No, no. The the QRO is uh, specifically for, okay, we're keeping it real, Dennis, yeah? So, yep. I mean, most of my subscribers are in North America. And sometimes when I'm operating portable, whether it's using FT8 or JSA call or, or something like that, uh, some data modes, you know, I want to be able to reach out and I have a QSO with some of my subscribers. I haven't reached uh, California very often, <laughs> unfortunately, but uh, it was important to get a QRO radio in the stable uh, so that I can connect with a lot more of the people who watch the videos. Mm -hmm. um, and the other side of that was having a, you know, a radio capable of QRO operation for emergency communications, for that, I, I always say it on the channel that uh, that Puerto Rico disaster type emergency communications. Um, yeah. So yeah. So no. Um, from the beginning, I, I have been a uh, from the beginning I've been a you know a QRP guy, even when I was doing weak signal work on uh, on VHF and and UHF, which mm -hmm. is you know kind of the, the way I got started, but. Um, Anyway, so yeah, th there's always purpose behind the, the choices and the equipment that, that I have. But uh, now going to my favorite radios, um, I'll never buy a Yezu FT818. I have here a, a Zygu G90 I'm, and that I can do everything I would normally do with my FT891 in the field with the G90. And the G90, it's a 20 watt radio. It's also HF plus six meters. It's also got IF filters. I actually love that radio as a 20 watt radio out in the field. Mm -hmm. It's absolutely uh, brilliant. And um, I, I love the user interface on the FT891 more, mm -hmm. but if I'm thinking about sustainable power, um, I would take the G90 over the 891 any day. Mm -hmm. These are those things you never hear on the channel, and I'm hope I'm I'm not being too forthcoming. And then, uh, well, let's skip to the good stuff. Yeah, the, <laughs> yes. the 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 good stuff is that uh, from a QRP perspective, I have two favorite radios at the moment. And to be honest with you, I I can't tell you honestly which one I love more. <laughs> There's that Russian radio, the TX five hundred. Yes. It's absolutely magnificent. Do you remember your first crush? You know, <laughs> it, for me, it was Grace Jones. I saw Grace Jones performing on TV. She was doing a song called the, uh, I forget, something Leatherette. Uh, anyway, I, and I thought, my God, this is uh, the woman I want to spend the rest of my life with. <laughs> you know, and you know that childhood crush. Yeah. You know? Yeah. When I got the TX500, I thought, wow, this is, you know, what I've been waiting for, you know, something that can operate in the rain, something that uh, you can just bash it around in your backpack and you, you don't have to care too much about it. You take it out when you need it, you know, it's going to yeah, work. Yeah, that thing looks like a slab of metal. <laughs> it is literally a slab of metal. Um, that's exactly what it is. And, uh, and for that reason, I, I don't have one that was a loner, yeah. but, uh, as soon as they're available, I'm, I'm going to have one. And the other radio, I'm, uh, the other radio I'm probably going to publish, uh, tomorrow because I don't want to publish during this, uh, election, you know, election fiasco, but, uh, the other radio is the ICOM IC705 and that. Yeah punches buttons for a different reason. So the, the TX500 is just a rugged monster. It's, uh, it's magnificent and I would bet my life on it. Let's say it that way. Mm -hmm. uh, the TX500 is in, I'm sorry, the, the, the IC705 is what, the, what I believe the Yezu FT818 should have been. Mm -hmm. You know, it's... Um, it's astonishing. 
everything you could possibly ask for, except an antenna tuner, uh, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> is built into that radio. Now, you know me, I, I'm always adapting. So if it doesn't have a tuner, I don't care. Uh, you know, I just changed the antenna. But um, yeah, the 705 is, and no one's paying me to say this, you know, um, it's just incredible because it, you've seen my, my, my 817 ND. I've got the 10 watt amplifier fire bolted to the top of it. I've got the, uh, uh, the antenna tuner. I've, I've got the filters. I added the, uh, the T uh, the TCXO, all of these things we have to add to the outside of it, the audio interface. Yeah. But everything on the 705 is already there. Yeah. So it's like a toolbox. You know, they call it a a, a, a shack in a box, mm -hmm. but uh, it, it's like, uh, remember these monster craftsman tool sets from Sears back in the day? Yes. <laughs> you know, that's, yes. But that's what the 705 is. The 705 is like a, 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 a toolbox uh, with everything you could possibly need with the exception of that, that tuner, if that's important to you. Yeah. Those are my two favorite radios at the moment from the QRP perspective. From the QRO perspective, you know, I'm still at the FT891 because uh, no one makes a uh, a lightweight uh, 100 watt radio for the field. The yeah. FT891 is the is you know the closest thing to it. And I know people will say, "What about the 7200? What about the 7300?" Yeah. But uh, if you carry those on a backpack or in your backpack, you can't carry anything else. Yeah, 7300 so. is an interesting kind of mid-sized radio, but yeah. I still can't imagine camping with it or even, you know, car camping is even the limit of what I would consider for the yeah. 7300. So, yeah. And, I actually picked yeah. up the 857. Oh. In, uh, I think it was in 2017. Yeah. And right after that, the 891 came out. I was like, ah, <laughs> it's like, why? <laughs> well, well, no, you're probably lucky because the initial 891s had some kind of weird noise problem inside mm -hmm. that uh, I think was later fixed with an update, you know, a firmware update. But uh, I mean, I had an 857 before, 857 Delta. I've also had the 897. I mean, you know, come on for the time. They were incredibly innovative radios. Actually, I also had an FT100, mm -hmm. which was uh, more compact, but more problems as well. Mm -hmm. You know, but the the 857, the 89, I I miss the 897. I wish that Yezu. Oh would, yeah, uh, yeah. Looks like a fine rig. I never actually have seen one in person, but I've I've heard about it a lot. The 897. Yeah, yeah. that was a magnificent radio. Actually, that was what brought me to the G90 because the 897 on batteries uh, ran on 20 watts. It output 20 watts. And, you know, the thinking behind this, this 20 watt number is most militaries around the world uh, have settled on this 20 watt uh, as a maximum output yeah. power, you know, yeah. in the field, you know, who am I to argue with them? I think it, I think it works and it's enough when you have the, the right antenna. Yeah, but yeah, the uh, the TX five hundred uh, as a QRP QRP plus HF radio, and the uh, and the seven hundred five. Those are my two favorite. The the TX five hundred goes to yeah. ten watts. Is it? Yeah, or five. Yeah. Okay, it's ten watts. watts. Okay. Yeah. Nice. And um, actually, I have to tell you, Dennis, I'm incredibly excited about these small companies popping up and doing this innovative work. The big manufacturers, okay, ICOM has just done an incredible job with the 705, but, you know, until the 705 came out, there really weren't a lot of full featured, all mode, all band choices. There was only really the 818, mm -hmm. you know, well, yeah. there, there was a KX3 as well, which is also a magnificent radio. Yep. But, um, uh, are you on a KX2 or a KX3? I have a KX3. Outstanding. Yeah, that would have been the radio I, I would buy from Elecraft if I was buying one. If you want to talk about other gear, I mean, 
You, you know my choice of solar panels. <laughs> yes, I wanted to mention that too briefly. Um, yeah, you're you have a lot of the different uh, styles of power film solar panels, yeah. and I'm very jealous. I just haven't really pulled the trigger on any one of them because the the price point is is really uh, providing a lot of resistance for me. Yeah. <laughs> but I do I, I want understand. to have, uh, you know. At least that roll-up one that that you've been showing lately, the one, the um, power saver, is it? What is is that? What? Oh called? yeah, the lightsaver. Lightsaver. The lightsaver. Yes. Yeah, I did a I did a video about that. That uh, one recently. is fascinating because twelve volts, five volts. Yeah. I mean, it's just yeah. it's kind of like everything in a little roll-up solar panel, and yeah. again, something like that, four hundred dollars here. <laughs> so I'm just like. Giving a little pause, but I think I will, I will eventually have one of those. Yeah, well, the the idea behind that one, uh, that's my favorite power supply for the QRP radios, you know, because you can, it, it'll supply up to five amps. I don't think there's any, you can get to 15 or 20 watts, you know, with, with, uh, with uh, some room to spare. So, yeah. But I'm using that with the 817 and uh, uh, with the G90, with the X5105, uh, with the TX500, and also the uh, uh, the 705. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you just can't get something in that small uh, form factor that'll recharge itself. And at least for me, the idea behind it was the through hiking. Yeah, you know the hiking I did with the cart and this 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 hiking trailer I, I have, mm -hmm. you know, so I, I power my radios and everything with that one. But then when I'm moving again, I can recharge the lightsaber max uh, while I'm moving because I'm not using the radios while I'm while I'm hiking, you know. And it's it's much more sustainable than you know lugging around you know big uh, solar panels you know, that you don't necessarily need when you're operating QRP. Uh, when I'm operating QRO, okay, so that's a that's a different, you know, or when I need to, you know, power lights and, and I have other equipment with me. So then I'll take some different solar panels. But um, the lightsaber is definitely uh, my favorite for operating QRP. Yeah, I, I eventually plan to have that with the 705. And that's oh, you're getting much, a 705? I have one. I actually received it uh, about, a about a month ago, but yes. <laughs> You've been holding out on me, Dennis. <laughs> so I'm, I'm just slowly discovering the all the different things about it. Uh, I hooked it up to my Surface Pro recently, got yep. FL rig set up and been using it on, uh, I tried it out with FL Digi, try out a yep. few digital modes. And it's just, it's a, it's such a pleasure to use. I just got to really figure out my, I, I want to build an end fed half wave antenna since, you know, I don't have the benefit That's of the ironic. tuner and yep. I'm going to see if I can have a portable setup that way. Yep. What band are you going to, to, I, ah, you're going to have different antenna elements for the different bands. Uh, yeah. Um, K6ARK showed a video once of how to build traps into a end fed half wave. So I'm going to try yeah, to do a yeah. 40, 20 because I spend most of the time in 40 and 20. Um, yeah. And then that was the coaxial uh, traps, wasn't it? Yes. And then I've oh, seen no. that video that, recently. It, it, he put little transformers and then there's like this QRP guys, little thing that you solder with uh, some components. And yeah, it, it, it looked like an interesting little project, but get a good resident on antenna. I'm not as ambitious. I don't want the five band, you know, trapped antenna no, or anything no, like no, that. No, no, uh, about I, 20 and 40, I. I think I'd be good. And uh, 80 is, a, I, I don't know if you go on 80 while in the field, but that's for wind link. Yeah. For wind link. That's, that's a significant amount of wire to be uh, putting somewhere. So <laughs> I, but, I don't have that ambition. Yeah. Well, when you see the 705 video I'm working on, uh, all the wind link was done on either 60 meters or 80 meters. Oh, okay. And, yeah. And uh, I was also skeptical <laughs> in the beginning 
you know, using the antenna that I was using, but uh, five watts with stations that were, you know, three, 400 kilometers, 500 kilometers away. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it, it worked out pretty well. But I was also thinking about uh, building a, a 49 to one uh, a Ballon, making an in-fed in uh, half wave from that. But the band changing is something that... Uh, that is a little bit scary for me. And that's how I found that, that video, the end fed video with the traps. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I think personally, I, I need to add some loading because uh, I know I'm going to lose a bit of efficiency, but mm -hmm. it's just, it's crazy having a, all that wire in the air. Like yeah. You said. <laughs> what is that? Like uh, 130 something feet or, <laughs> yeah, it's or more. crazy <laughs> is what it is, you, <laughs> you know? I mean, it is what it is, and you know we're we're passionate about our our ham radio, so we will definitely find a way. You know. Yeah. Well, an hour has gone fast here. I, I just wanted to ask you. Lastly, uh, do you have advice for anyone uh, who's listening, or you know, do, do you want to talk about how they can learn more about the stuff that you you put out there to educate people? Actually. Let me ramble on for a couple of, for a little bit. And, and there's a few different points I'd like to make. Okay. Get out in the field and, and try. It doesn't matter if you fail, um, because when you fail, you actually learn something. If you're not failing, you're not trying hard enough. You, you don't see it. And perhaps I should publish it on the videos more often. Well, you know it, Dennis, that I've got this frostbite on my hands. Mm. Um, if you're If you're not having failures, you're not trying hard enough. And this is especially true for preparedness and emergency communications. Get away from the diesel generators and, uh, you know, try to operate with a battery and, and really learn about operating off grid or operating, uh, you know, away from mains power or, you know what I mean? Just, just get out and try walk further than, uh, than a few feet from your car and set up your radio or just go to some random spot, even, you know, whether it's a park or one of my favorite places is, you know, to go is uh, to the beach. Mm, you know, yeah. I go and I find, find a spot on the beach. I set up an antenna and I, and I do my thing. And I do that whether it's in the winter or the summer, but it's, again, it's about getting out there and trying. Um, or if I want uh, one of my buddies, you know, he's one of my best internet friends, uh, John, he's uh, November zero, uh, uh, Joliet Sierra Delta, I think it is, or uh, Delta Sierra. Anyway, we talk a lot, you know, on uh, chatting on the internet and things like that. But sometimes I just, uh, I will send him a Winlink email. I set up, you know, a radio and a super antenna and uh, I send him a Winlink email just because it's fun and uh, because it's it's practice and integrate these type of things into your everyday life um, so that when you need them, when your life depends on them, hopefully it doesn't come to that, but when your life depends on it or when you're really, you know, in a real emergency situation, it's second nature already. Mm -hmm. you know, yeah. Don't wait for someone. Uh, we shouldn't wait for someone to tell us when we should have a, a field day or winter field day, freak. every day is winter field day this time of year yeah. for me. <laughs> um, you know what I mean? So the, the message I want to send to people is get out and try. The other message is if you're not building at least part of your gear, you're really losing out. I mean, I, I, I have never built radios. Maybe was it this tuna can transceiver back in the day? Mm -hmm batteries or antennas or uh, different circuits like a, a dc dc converter or just try those are the things that uh, that define us and uh, and help us grow in this magnificent hobby yeah you know yeah so just try mm. yeah and, and the last thing if i may is share what you're doing <laughs> yes yeah there aren't enough people 
and sharing what they're doing. I get emails every day, people, hey, Julian, I just wanted to show you what I built, mm -hmm. you know, and that's great. You know, people can send that. I mean, I get dozens of emails every day, but I would rather, you know, people don't send me email, but share on a blog or on YouTube or on Instagram, just share what you've done with amateur radio, or portable power, or a guy built a wind generator and shared it with me, but didn't share it with anybody else. And I'm like, you know, hey, Instagram is free. Just yeah. share it. Get it out. So there. that's, yeah, Let that's people the last see thing. it. Well, thank you, Julian. It's been fascinating. I can honestly say just talking with you, hearing your backstory, your thought process and a lot of these things that you've been working on. So thank uh, you. Really like to thank you for spending the time with me this morning. As you hinted, this was recorded uh, just after election day here in the U.S. So hopefully uh, we'll find out soon what's going on with that. Yeah. But in the meantime, by the time this releases, which it should be in about a week or so, this, this will be a great thing for people to listen to to get their mind off of the after effects of whatever that thing is going to do. Yeah. <laughs> And again, you, you have been an inspiration for me. Thank you for sharing those initial videos and just even showing me how to wire a battery together indirectly. And yeah, no problem. It, I mean, it's something that I even now continue to do, continue to practice. Well, there's going to be more of that, Dennis. Great. I'm going to yeah. definitely link your, all your links. I'll get your um, Instagram and all that. But I'll, I'll link your Patreon, your YouTube, Twitter, all that in the show notes. Uh, and I definitely encourage you, if you're listening and haven't uh, really looked through Julian's videos, check them out. They, they span the whole spectrum of from starting with power all the way through to antennas and operating in the field. So definitely something to check out if you want to see how it's done in extreme conditions. Yeah, thank you, Dennis. It's actually been a pleasure, and I was a bit freaking out about this, but you know, I've known you for a couple of years now, and yeah. uh, you're a cool guy. So well, I thought, that, well, this <laughs> won't it won't kill me, you know. <laughs> yeah, and yeah. like I tell everyone, it's it really is just conversation, you know, just talking about little topics here and there. And so I'm glad that we could actually arrange this. I, I when I first reached out to you. I was like, I wonder how this is going to work because Julian's on is like in a whole different time zone. So it's going to be, it's going to be rough for one of us, but we worked it yeah. out. We worked it yeah. out where I'm, this is the start of my day. It's the kind of the end of your day, but it's still a reasonable hour for both of us. <laughs> yeah. But it's been a pleasure, man. I've had a blast and I hope I didn't ramble too much for you. Oh no, I love the rambling. That's where we get into <laughs> the good stuff. <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough. All right. All right, Dennis, thank you very much for this. And I'll yes. talk to you again soon. Yeah. Yeah. I'll say seven, three. And thanks seven, again. Three. Yep. You've been listening to Hamden Thoughts by AD 60M. Thanks again for listening. And we'll catch you next time.